हेलो 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 Hello. 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 Daniels, very nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah. Good. Uh. Good morning. It's it's still morning where you are. We are in afternoon. It's three thirty, right? Yeah. Here. What what time is it? Over? Three thirty in the afternoon. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. It's about ten thirty here. So yeah, it's awesome. Awesome to chat with you. Thanks for reaching out. All right, uh, thank you. Okay, briefly, let me use a minute to introduce myself and what we do. Uh, my name is Daniels. I'm a civil engineer, uh, real estate yeah. developer, and then uh, I'm actually an investor too. So uh, together with um, someone, I actually we actually found yeah. uh, a space where we teach Africans how to invest in, um, in equities and other markets. Recently, we just started uh, teaching crypto and a lot of other things too. So from time to time, we do talk to people, we do meet people, to actually share these uh, ideas to Africans. Uh, so can you just briefly let everyone that's uh, watching know who you are? Okay. So I, I'm Sean Eddings. Uh, I'm, I'm an investor, uh, mainly an entrepreneur. So I, I run a real estate photography business here in upstate New York. So a lot of people, if I say I'm, I, I live in New York, they think, oh, you live in this, the city, but there's actually a lot of New York State compared to New York City. Uh, so I live up, up there by a, a university called Cornell University. A lot of people might have heard that before. Uh, and so mainly what I do is I take professional photos and you know, 3D tours, floor plans, and uh, drone photography, videography, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's my my main business. Uh, and I, I've uh, pr previous to this, I was actually working with uh, another investor named Ian Castle, and we created uh, the Intelligent Fanatic Project books. Uh, we we co-wrote two. Uh, there was another one in India, and. For me, I was just doing that as an, as an investor, just to learn as much as I could on great businesses. And then uh, now I'm just trying to utilize a lot of the things that I've learned from that uh, into my own business. Okay, uh, that's actually fantastic. I was uh, reading the, the writings of the intelligent uh, fanatic and he's actually brilliant. And I've read a lot of your articles too uh, since we last spoke on Twitter. So uh, I'm definitely gonna pass everything down to the community to actually read some of your works. So I just want to understand, how did you actually get into investing? And then uh, the whole intelligent phonetics, how did you get into investing as a person? Because you said on your website, uh, you are mainly into music too. You didn't mention that you have a, an experience in music. So I, growing up, uh, I, ha I had, my father was a guitar player. And when I was about, I remember probably one of the first memories of my dad was actually him pulling out his guitar and playing. And so that was, a, you know, made a big impact on me, but I didn't really get into 
music very uh, fanatically uh, until I was probably about 10 years old. Uh, I picked up uh, my dad's guitar and I just started to learn as much as I can. And one thing led to another. I actually went to school for, for music in Boston, uh, ma mainly learning jazz, jazz guitar. And one, one thing that I've noticed throughout that whole experience, and I, I spent, you know, talk, talk about the 10,000 hour rule, I spent more than 10,000 hours on, you know, becoming a musician. One thing that I noticed, even though I spent all that time learning, the best, most efficient learning happened when I was modeling, emulating uh, the great guitar players and musicians. And so what I noticed was, okay, well, if that's the great way to get into music and to learn it very quickly, and you see all the other great musicians, that's how they do it. But they eventually come up and have their own twist. To it. Uh, and so I actually, so I went to school, I, I just found that it wasn't the place for me because as, as you probably can tell, music isn't a very uh, profitable venture unless you're extremely lucky and you, you just have an amazing talent. Uh, for me, I, you know, I guess I wasn't as lucky and I just figured out that wasn't the game that was best for me to play. Uh, so I got into investing and the first thing I did when I got into investing was you know, find the greatest of investor and try to learn as much as I can from them. So I looked at Warren Buffett. Uh, he said, read Intelligent Investor. So I did that. Uh, and over, and so long story short, because there's a lot, a lot of stuff that happened in between there, but I really got into investing in about 2014, 2013, 2014, 2015. I really tried to say, okay, well, if I want to become a great investor. I want to really look and find these, you know, hundred baggers, thousand baggers very, very early on, and then be able to hold them. So can I find the next Walmart, Amgen, Netflix, Amazon, and be able to hold them, you know, buy them uh, in a big enough size and then hold them. And so, well, I thought, okay, well, what's the easiest way? Well, like I said, with a musician, they, they emulate the greats. Well, they kind of also look back, kind of trace back the uh, steps that a great musician will take. So I said, okay, well, I need to retrace the steps of all those great businesses and see where they started when they were tiny, tiny, tiny companies. And so I got into micro caps. Uh, and then from there, I, I just really started looking at Walmart when it was you know, IPO'd in the early 70s. Uh, and then I started to think, okay, well, I need to figure out what is the characteristic or the leaders that create these businesses. Cause I think that's one of the areas that people can, you know, fi figure out, you can look at the leader, you can uh, analyze them, how they're creating the business and the culture and what type of DNA that's going to drive the business. And that I think is one of the biggest factors people you know, overlook. And I think it's one of the most valuable things. And uh, uh, I've been able to utilize it in my own investing. And like I said, now, uh, you know, studying intelligent fanatics and, that, you know, use, using it to make my own business. All right. Uh, that's actually fantastic. Uh, since you talked of management, let's just uh, jump into that uh, really quickly. Uh, how do you assess management to know, okay, that this management is going to be a little bit profitable yep. for you? Uh, for the business in the long run, what are the like yastics and the criteria do you use to uh, analyze bit. management? And I think the most important thing with my oh well, well oh, okay, so I kind of uh, uh, broke up a little bit for a second, but I think one of the most important things that I look for. I first try to build up my pattern recognition, so that's why I've spent all this time on studying great leaders and great cultures because I think there isn't one particular quality. There's a couple qualities that are, you know, important, you know, incentives. Uh, there, there's, you know, communication happens. There's just so much to it. But I, and I think the most important aspect is that there's kind of a mosaic. There's Specific. 
followed, else. but I think it's just having all of those people that's been able to help me. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Must have a little. Can you can you say something? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. 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 Can you hear me loud and clear? Okay. So I I don't know where. where yeah, I, I I can hear you clearly now. Okay. Do you was, do you know where? What yeah, was we last were talking about you heard? We, we are talking about the management. Uh, you talked about there are some incentives that you look at uh, to know whether this management is going to be good for this company. And why I asked that question actually is, uh, especially when it comes to micro caps, especially for us uh, in the developing countries, we don't have um, as much access to the kind of information everybody has. So that's why most times when we even advising people on joining the markets, we even make it as a rule. Don't invest in micro caps and all that because uh, uh, not a lot of information and then not a lot of access to the management. So I just want to know how you assess the management to get the information to know, okay, this is uh, going to be a valuable company. Let's say in, in a year or two, it's going to be a multi-bagger. How do you assess that? Well, it's it's really hard to know if something's going to be a multi-bagger in a year or two, <laughs> but you just hope, hope that it, you know, you you assess the, the management. But, but, you know, for, for instance, like I said, it's just building up that pattern recognition. So looking at all of the different incentives that have worked in the past and have been mm -hmm. extremely successful, and then being able to you you know see a situation that comes up and then be able to see if it's important. So for instance, you know if a company doesn't have any options that they're giving out, you know you have to go and ask the management. You have to go and ask like the people who are within the company and see how the incentives actually work. Cause sometimes yeah. you might find a situation where a company might not issue stock options, but the way that they're incentivizing the, their employees is actually more, you know, more uh, efficient than, you know, a stock option. So for instance, they might have uh, like the uh, new core, new core steel with Ken Iverson, he set up a system where the employees are paid a low base pay. And then they're, they have a very high variable component to their compensation package based on what, you know, specific achievable, measurable uh, characteristics that the business, you know, that that individual can achieve themselves. Uh, and then you be able to see how that incentive compares to competitors. So if you're looking at a steel company, majority of them are going on, you know, base pay. It's usually pretty, pretty crappy pay. But if you have a si situation where the incentives are, okay, well, everybody's going to get a, you know, pretty flat uh, base pay. And then if you get these achievable metrics, then you're going to be able to, you know, have people really working hard because I think with incentives it comes to the main point of management main point of management is getting the environment set a specific way and then just getting out of the way the behaviors because you're incentivizing for certain behaviors work themselves out and if you're looking at a a business, if you're looking at a sports team, if you're looking at really any kind of situation where there's a group of people trying to achieve high levels of performance, it's the incentives are extremely important. But the way those incentives are applied per situation are going to vary. But the more that you understand the great ones that have worked in the past, the more likely you'll be able to spot specific ones. For instance, one of the reasons why you've reached out to me is because of the company uh, EXP Realty. Yeah. And so I was just talking about, okay, well, low base pay, high variable pay is very good in certain situations, but in terms of a real estate uh, brokerage, what might be more beneficial would be having the stock options based on certain metrics yeah. and having all of the other incentives being revenue share, but yeah. not having revenue share and the money coming out of the person that you're recruiting's pocket. So each time they make a transaction, a portion of their pay, no, the portion of the company's pay 
goes to the recruiter and then there's a cap. So there's many different ways. So like I said, it's for me, it's trying to look at all of the situations that incentives were very, very uh, well utilized and then be able to see uh, you know, situations currently if it might be you know, a more effective than competitors might be. Yeah. All right. Uh, you mentioned ESP. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, I think uh, your, your deep dive was actually fantastic. Uh, it's been a while, I actually saw somebody that just captured the whole idea. And uh, uh, personal as a relator, although I'm not uh, within the same geographical location, I really understand the company and I wish I could even have uh, some kind of model of that uh, where I am currently. But I discovered a lot of people were having uh, some sort of uh, rebooters to that. And some of them, we are not, uh, some of them, they are not uh, into, the, into the ecosystem. They don't understand about real estate. So uh, one particular person was asking, uh, why are they not putting their customers first and all that? So uh, I know you've said a lot about that, but what do you, uh, I would just like you to uh, have something to say uh, about a company that actually tries to uh, incentivize their uh, their employees, believing that the employees will now treat their uh, customers right. Is it uh, a good method for a company to follow right. through? Well, I, I think if if somebody if a company focuses on a specific, uh, let's call it a stakeholder. So stakeholder being okay. You can have employees are a stakeholder, customers are a stakeholder, partners or suppliers are a stakeholder, community would be another stakeholder. So if you focused on just one, you're going to have a blind spot. Okay, yeah. and I think probably the one. So so any anytime somebody says well. If I, the company is great because it focuses directly on customers and they might give this one example being Amazon. Okay. And yeah. Amazon. And so Jeff Bezos has always customer is king. And of yeah. course he, he does it. And they've been able to set up their business where it's very, very, very well run. Uh, but one thing you'll start to see is employees aren't, you know, top of the chain. Yeah. And so if you go to a warehouse uh, and you'll, you'll hear reports of this where employees are worked to the bone, they, you know, in pre COVID uh, they weren't, you know, getting paid as much. I think yeah. they, they've since raised the, the, so I think focusing on just one, you know, just the customer, I think eventually you'll get to a point long-term where things start to break down. And that would be, imagine having all of these warehouses and you have a very high turnover of employees, yeah. okay? And then it gets to the point where you're running out of new employees to bring in because you just have too much turnover. And so then you'll start seeing in the culture, it's the negativity seeping through. And then it starts, you know, and how people are treated, those employees might be, you know, customer service people. I'm sure they're probably uh, treated a little bit better than the uh, warehouse yeah. employees. But I think yeah. long-term, you know, Amazon's going to have problems and they have had problems because they have all these reports now coming out where employees are saying, you know, it's horrible. And then, yeah. you know, there's a bad reputation, yeah. you know, and who knows what goes on from there. But I think they'll do well. But I think just based on their model, which is more transactional, uh, I think it's, you know, it can happen a little bit. But I think with a service business, you cannot one bit focus just on you know customers or just partners you have to focus on like the employees first uh, because if you think who who's the one who's facing the the customer well it's the employee if you treat the yeah. employee like you know, excuse my language but like shit they're going to mirror they're going to re reciprocate because yeah. i think we have to understand the uh you know human nature or not even human nature just animal nature that being, if you, you know, beat an animal, how are they going to treat you back? They're going to treat you like you treat them. They're going to be scared. They're going to, you know, they're going to try to bite you. Uh, and I think it's the same thing with people. If you treat a human being, you know, not very nicely, uh, and you're trying to make the situation where you're paying for their, their service, and they're, yeah. they're just going to do everything to stab you in the back. Yeah. They're going to treat customers like crap. And so I think in a lot of times uh, there's many companies 
that people might say, well, they are more customer focused. Well, it's actually, if you dig deeper down like Costco. So I, yeah. in the Intelligent Fanatics project, we looked at Saul Price and Saul Price was really the uh, progenitor of Costco. He created FedMart, which turned into Price Club, which is the, uh, was acquired by Costco. And he uh, tutored or, you know, mentored Jim Senegal. Jim Senegal was the co-founder with Jeff Brotman of Costco. And what they always did was focus on the employee because not only would the employee treat them well, they treat the supplier well, mm -hmm. and that allows them to get lower costs, right? And there, if you treat those people really well at lower cost, and then uh, the model that they set up where it's not tons of SKUs, uh, they focus on smaller SKUs, get more uh, scale and efficiency. You can pass that savings on to the customer. And then the customer comes in, okay, not only is it cheap, well, it's cheap because the employee who's really good with the partner got it cheap, but you know the people there who are customer facing, they're paid well, they're treated well, they reciprocate. So it's, I think it's uh, and another uh, one thing that a lot of people just don't really think about because it seems in, unintuitive. Oh, if I pay somebody very well, uh, treat them very well, that they'll in turn treat the customer yeah. very well. Because yeah. a lot of times companies, especially public, public cater to the customer. No, usually not. They usually cater to the employee. No, usually not. Who do they, they cater to the shareholder. And they're, tr they're trying to get, you know, the earnings up for the next 30 days, you know, in the next quarter. It's a very short term minded. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, you know, a slow decline from there. So that's, uh, and I'll give one more example, Herb, Herb Kelleher with Southwest Airlines. And he literally said, you know, first person that we care about is the employee because that's, he literally said, it's because of that reciprocation. And because of the culture is, uh, you know, love oriented and, you know, sharing abundance, you know, that is in turn shared with the employee, uh, the customers, and then you know you get this cult-like following with uh, customers, and it's, it's the same same thing with others yeah. uh, that I've I've come across that have been extremely successful. Yeah, I, I think what, one of the most important uh, important uh, sayings I've had uh, from Branson Richard, uh, the CEO of uh, Virgin Galactica, uh, where he said uh, that. What he wants to do is just to treat the customer right and the customer uh, treat the employees right and the employees will take care of the customers. And I think it's a brilliant statement. Um, that even made me get uh, more interested in um, Virgin Galactic. Now, having mentioned that, I would just like to use maybe maybe a minute to get your uh before I get your your insight on some of the industries, I want to get uh I want to understand a little bit of your personal investment uh, style. Can you still hear me loud and clear? Hi, Sean. Hi, Sean. That's breaking up a little bit. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I just yeah, can't I hear you. Can you? Yeah, I, I okay, just, there you go. Yeah, I just joined back, so it is unmuted. So I want to understand a little bit about your uh, investment style. Do you actually focus on uh, allocating like some portions of your portfolio to some uh, sizes? Do you believe in portfolio sizing? And when do you sell? When do you take profit? Uh, let's just use maybe two or three minutes to understand that. I, I don't really have any portfolio building metrics i just built like when i see an opportunity i'll invest i've been trying to not invest too much at the beginning and uh buy as uh that management executes i don't really have any and what one thing like like i talk about a little bit of investing on my twitter or yeah. you know what i blog about but I've, a majority of my time is you know 
running my business. That's mainly what I'm yeah. focusing my time on. Yeah, that, that's actually a uh, good. Uh, I read a commentary uh, sometime. Uh, actually, putting more energy in your business is 100%. And then uh, I was reading, uh, that was a book by Nassim Taleb. Here he says, uh, uh, most of your time should be in your business. And then you should even use investing just like uh, for recreational purposes. Um, so uh, the next thing I just wanted to have is, uh, what industries are you looking at the moment? Uh, the space industry, we have AI. Some people have labeled this age, the age of, the age of uh, disruption. So are you looking into healthcare? Are there any disruptive ideas or industry that you're looking at at the moment? Uh, in terms of looking for investment, no, but uh, in terms of what I'm, I'm interested in could be definitely disruptive, virtual reality. That's definitely something I'm very uh, interested in. I, I'm, I'm investing a little bit of money in terms of me creating something on the virtual reality space, because I think that's going to be a uh, absolute monumental uh, way, new way of experiencing yeah. shopping uh, and pretty much everything. Uh, and if, if you think that my, my business is pretty much based around virtual, uh, it's not literally virtual reality. There's components of the 3D tour where you can put on a three, uh, 360 or VR headset and yeah. actually go through a home. Uh, but I, I, I want to, I can definitely see where a lot of this is going. I just, in, in terms of adoption rate of headsets uh, will yeah. probably be a, a big thing and then people accepting. Uh, so eventually something that I've done is I actually made my uh, office into a, uh, a Shopify website yeah. uh, you, using my technology. Uh, I'll launch that eventually because I'll, I'll be selling these pieces of art. Um, and so I'll, I'll be doing that eventually. And I think that's I've, I've figured out ways to integrate a Shopify site with m one of my 3D tours. And I think that could be something that would be very beneficial and, you know, utilizing that new technology. All right. Uh, so uh, let me just dive a little into maybe the Metavax and, and uh, ESPI uh, Vibrella, the virtual reality. Uh, so some time ago, I was listening to Glenn, uh, the yep. CEO of ESP, actually talking about Vibrella. He talked about something I have personally experienced. He talked about uh, the fatigue that comes with Zoom. Uh, you are just sitting there looking at someone at a screen. Uh, you don't have to experience, uh, like when you go to a meeting or a conference, you can actually walk up to someone and all that. Uh, do you think Vibrella is going to take a big part of that? And then right. what do you think about the metaverse? I just mentioned that. I know you know about the metaverse, right? Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Uh in, in terms of Verbella uh, becoming a big player, like in the VR metaverse, that kind of stuff, uh, yeah. who, who knows? That's, an, you know, a, a free app now, you know, for, for that company, because, you know, nobody's really uh, pricing that in. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I think it just comes down to how, how the company is set up, the culture, and how they're thinking about in, innovation. And I think yeah. they, they have a very interesting perspective with that. Uh, but it's a personal experience. So during COVID, uh, I had a virtual reality headset. Uh, a couple of my friends, one in Colorado and one in Hawaii had a headset. And so what we had done and we still kind of do is we pop on our headsets and then we go to a virtual uh, environment and we actually sit down and we're you know, sitting across from each other and you know, having conversations. And that was very helpful, not only just to connect with people, but it's something that is, you know, going to be the future. So instead of, you know, like you said, doing a, a Zoom call where it's just, you know, 2D and it's, it's it is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with the VR is going to be huge, you know, and Verbella could have a big portion of, of, of that. Who knows? Uh, but part. For me, I, I, I just like the, the incentives, how things are set up, being at all uh, additive sum or win-win. Uh, that's why they've been growing, how they've been growing, and why I think they'll, they'll grow uh, pretty quickly in, in the future. All right, uh, let's just dive into NFTs a little, uh, because you, you've already talked about your business and how you are planning to, uh, uh, what you are doing with Shopify. 
So what do you think about NFTs and where do you see that going uh, in the near future? Is your business incorporating uh, that fully into everything you do at the moment? Uh, no. Uh, one, one thing though, I can talk about at least the uh, blockchain. Uh, so NFTs, now it's like I, I have physical piece of art uh, okay. and I think that's, you know, <laughs> so the NFT doesn't really, I, you know, if there is some type of metaverse, eventually I could sell it, but it's, it wouldn't be as uh, big, I think, but yeah. who knows. But in terms of like blockchain, I, I could see the technology benefiting uh, real estate photographers. So one of the things that we have seen, so, you know, we create photos, we create digital assets. And I have a, uh, an agreement with my clients that being, okay, I'm giving you limited license. So you can use it for marketing pur purposes of selling the property only and for a year. And then after that, you would have to pay more for full ownership. And I think the blockchain could be beneficial with copyright. So copyright claims and that type of stuff yeah. with yeah. Uh, photography, yeah. with uh, other types of digital assets that are much more difficult to uh, apply full ownership of, you know, bits, bits and bytes. Right. But okay. Who who knows who who does that and how they get the token? Yeah. yeah. Any right. other uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, no, not uh, any other question really. I've exhausted my list. I'll just uh, generally like to get uh, uh, what you've learned so far since you started investing. Maybe you can drop a word or two uh, uh, to the community so that they can actually uh, just get one key word or one key lesson uh, from your investment journey so that they can use that as their mantra and then learn along. So if, if you want to really become a master at investing, I, I think you should do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work of retracing the strip, uh, the steps of greatness. Uh, the more preparation, the more you pay with that up front, uh, you're going to see monumental dividends paid in the future. Uh, but it's it's a really it's a dogged fight every day, just trying to learn all you know all this inf new information and retain it uh, and then be able to get to a point where it all becomes second nature and you'll be able yeah. to you know keep up with the fast tempo of business and because that's i think a lot of people they'll spend their time uh just looking at all these new companies and hoping they'll find the next one but if you have no clue what a great one looks like how yeah. how the heck you're gonna have the conviction to hold the next great one yeah. uh, so I, i'd say if you want to do very well in investing, uh, like long term, hold multi, you know, multi, multi, multi baggers and have the conviction to hold them, you need to put in tons and tons of work. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've seen it work for me and I know it, it's worked for others in any kind of field they've been in. So, you know, it's, it's totally doable, but it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, uh, good luck. That's right. That's yeah. my. <laughs> yeah, that's my, my I advice. actually read the, uh, your deep dive and the the, the wood uh, wood shading and all that. The problem is a lot of people don't have uh, they don't have the tenacity to actually put in that much work. Uh, they are looking for faster ways and all that. I think you're actually fantastic. Uh, learned a lot from you. I believe the community is going to learn a lot from you. So I'm going to drop the link to all your articles, the ones that you want, and then cool. the book and any other thing you want me to show the community in the description of this video, so that anyone that wants to get across to you uh, can find a way to get across to you. Thank you so much for actually speaking to us today. Uh, I really appreciate you. I'm hoping we can talk to you more on a later date. Sure. It was great, great meeting you, Dan Daniels, and thank you for, for reaching out. Uh, you know, I'm my my door is always open. I, I'm busy with my business, but you know, if anybody has any questions, feel free to yeah. to reach out. I always like uh, you know, quote unquote, jamming with with people and sharing ideas and yeah. learning. I definitely don't know a lot, and that's that's one thing. You know, I, I I'm always trying to learn something new from anybody and everybody. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much. It's actually great to admit that you don't know, but a lot of people don't admit that. I'm hoping uh, we can speak to you soon. Do have a great day.
Yep, you too. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye.